Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a uh, pleasure to be, and an honor to be here uh, talking. Um, uh, I will talk about the history of ALD and fundamentals, so I've enjoyed the talks of this morning very much. From a practical point of view, I've learned a lot. Now we will zoom in the mechanistic details of the processes a little bit, so a different viewpoint to partly the same things. Just to make sure that everybody is on the same page, I have this one introduction of AOD. So we are talking of a uh, cyclic process that is based on at least, typically at least two gaseous reactants that are brought to a surface to react uh, after each other to build film. There can be more than two, but typically it's two. And if you look at the, uh, how the mass on the surface um, decreases with time, it's stepwise. It's not continuous. We are talking of a process that stops by itself all the time. Um, this figure is from the review by Stephen George. It has gathered an uh, enormous amount of citations, 2,400. That's very, very unusual. That means already that uh, it testifies of the impact of AOD in the world. There is such a review. Why am I talking about this here? Um, why am I talking about the history of AOD? I have nothing to do with the early history. I was born about the same time as AOD was started, but I have had a, the history of AOD as a hobby all through my working life. So I graduated from uh, Helsinki University of Technology, working with AOD for catalysis, uh, aluminum nitride, actually. Then I've been a postdoc at IMEC, working with the high cave development uh, to make vacuum oxide for the computers. Then I've been at uh, VPP, Technical Research Center of Finland, working with AOD for MEMS, and now, since two years, I'm a professor at Aalto University, which is actually the same as where I studied, but it has merged with two others. And uh, again, I do AOD and some other things for analysis. And um, if you would think, what, what did I actually give to the field? Well, I have taken here the three highlights of myself. So the review from 2005 was already mentioned. It has more than 1,300 citations, so it's a pretty good one also. Then the uh, virtual project on the history of AOD, that is starting to defect the field already. The views on the history are changing. And then the third thing is an AOD Functionality test concept, and here I have a question mark in the star, so I don't yet know whether that's going to impact the field, but that has also great potential, I think, to change the way we are doing things. Here is how I have divided the talk. Um, first, on the history, who, when, why, and what. Then some very general things on the surface chemistry of AOD. Um, I will go through some very basic terminology again to try to have us on the same page and don't uh, don't get bored. It's going to be very basic in the beginning, but I would like to promise that everybody hears new things here. If you didn't, you can come and complain after the talk. And uh, then some progress notes on understanding uh, the surface chemistry. And I have a course section which is pretty short where it's able to use and conclusion of course. And here you will see then some Twitter words here, so these slides will be shared afterwards, and I am trying to record the presentation, so that will also be shared if it works out. And each Twitter sign is actually a portal, so you click on it, and it opens a Twitter world to you related to that subject that is there. So there's always a link behind. Okay, notes on the history of ALD. ALD has been uh, discovered or in, uh, invented independently twice. That's it's said already in your preface that you got. Um, Tom Suntala is here. Uh, he's the Finnish inventor. He came up the, with the concept in 1974. And uh, the other one, uh, and he was calling it atomic ethics. Then, not very far away from us, actually, in St. Petersburg, there was also a group and it was a bit earlier. They were working with other types of applications. They gave the technique another name. They were calling it <coughs> which is translated more to the layering. And uh, they came up with the same technique through a totally different group. These persons who are there, the original inventors, they have both passed out already. 
Thomas Mutala is uh, doing uh, spill energetically, and uh, he actually got the Millennium Technology Prize for his achievements last year. This is a um, 1 million euro prize that is given every two years. And so far, three Nobel Prize winners have received it. And the nomination period for next time starts 1st of April. If you have somebody put in mind, you can ask them. It's a global prize. So, what did Tuomo Suntola then actually do? Well, it's a long story, and if you want to uh, see the whole story, you can look at the essay that I wrote <coughs> in close collaboration with Tuomo Suntola a few years ago, but we'll go through it in a short day today. So, he wanted to make flat panel displays uh, to, to make small displays in hospitals to save space. And he uh, had a Lincoln background, and he thought that if you would be able to grow material so that it's very controlled from the very beginning on, you would get better properties for crystalline films than, for example, bus bar. And uh, he constructed a reactor where he made the very first steps by uh, vaporizing zinc and sulfur elements and delivering those to the uh, substrate. Actually, the substrate is moving. It's a spatial AOD system, the very first one, two rotations per second. And um, so he was doing the spatial AOD and uh, observing. He had an in situ system where he could observe the interference color of the film that was grown on glass. So he was waiting to see purple interference uh, color coming. And from that, he would know how thick the film is. The very first one he missed, but then he found the second, the, the next ones. So the uh, experiment was successful. He was pretty disappointed because he wanted, he expected to get a one monolayer per cycle. But he didn't get it. The growth was much lower, about one third of a monolayer per cycle. Actually, in hindsight, that's a really, really successful first experiment if you are able to grow the film. Here we get already to this monolayer mentioned in the preface, and we will come back to this later in the presentation. So the very first ones were made with elemental uh, reactants. Well, it was quite soon uh, found that uh, compound reactants were done. This is then Lindfors next to a reactor, a simple reactor that he built. And this is where the zinc sulfide experiment, so zinc sulfide was the target material, and manganese doping was the one that gives the, the yellow electroluminescent uh, color. So here the um, in the soft core reactor, they managed to grow zinc sulfide from compound reactants, zinc chloride, and hydrogen sulfide. And that is the process that is still being used today. And a few years, so that's from 77 or 78. I'm sorry, I don't have it. Years here, this is from somewhere mid 80s. <coughs> so they managed to get to the target and start producing electroluminescent things. Uh, uh, this place, I'm sorry. When that was done, Suntola is the inventor of the technology. He's the one who made these things happen. But if you start commercializing something, if you start fine tuning something to get you know, better commercial status, and so it might be another type of leader. So well, that's what happened in Finland. The leader was changed to somebody who would then make this a company and a product. Suntola was invited to start. Um, Bought the company for an aspect where they would use the new atomic day deposition technique for now not converting electricity to light but converting light to electricity for photovoltaics. And next day, the chemical company and they started working with catalysts very, very quickly. Um, to make their own research, they needed small research reactors, and that's where this uh, F120 reactor was formed in 87, I believe. We still have many of those in Finland. And uh, so they made solar power panels uh, with quite good uh, properties. And they also made catalysts. I think I read somewhere that a batch of 40 kilos was made in a few days bed. But that activity was stopped uh, in the late 90s because there was no prospect to scale up in those days. Now the world might be differently there. 
But what was important was that Google had also a vision <coughs> in early, early 80s that this technique could be really useful in microelectronics. He was far ahead of his time in those days. But here is a picture from the Materials Research Society Conference in 1994. Microchemistry had a stand there with 200 millimeter papers uh, with AOD from the aluminum oxide to show. And uh, that started the, the pathway to, to uh, microelectronics. In the words of Suntola, it was 1994, uh, 1995, that was the real breakthrough into microelectronics. So it's 2007 that the computer started having AOD then, but 95 is when it really started. It takes quite some time to break through. Okay, so Sultola started marketing. Another thing started at the same time where Sultola didn't have so much to do, but that was the development of color displays. Full color displays would be uh, ideally achieved. So this is from uh, Mark Leskelas. Lecture. Uh, he retired and he gave a very, very nice overview lecture where he tells about the development. They were uh, developing different types of chemistries to get the, the uh, red color and to get the blue color for the uh, full color, color display. This was started at the Helsinki University of Technology, where I am from. It's actually not in Helsinki, it's in Espo. I think many people confuse the two universities. He then moved to the University of Helsinki, took at least part of the research with him, and that has been growing there. And for example, our first speaker has been uh, a follower, follower of that. What happened with this uh, uh, color development? Well, no color was missing. They were not able to make blue. They were able to make red, and we got up blue, and eventually, Three color displays were realized, not full color displays, and actually chemistry had nothing to do with that, so it was all done by paper. So a lot of research, a lot of uh, development of processes that wasn't taken into uh, use, but it could be interfered with through a lot of understanding of, of how AOD works, and of course I found, found it the basis how uh, the Lestela group has been uh, then for a long time leading. Uh, in the development. Sultala himself wrote uh, what he calls his major review in 1989. Elsevier has given uh, free open access for this paper thanks to the Millennium Technology Prize. So you can go and get a copy of this. It's for one year, at least like that. So this also deals with the history a little bit. So Suntala was collecting for this review information of the first publications from different sources. So this actually can be used to read really when did people start doing AOD in different places. So there's a, a star, if it was just analysis, and then you can see who actually made these films. So in Finland, uh, there were several groups who were first, then Japan, then USA, and then many other countries. I think I'm there or something. And as said, in 2014, an essay was published. I was discussing related to the history activities with Zumpala. I was actually originally motivated to find out what Russians do actually. But when I discussed with him, I noticed that he tells me so many things that I didn't know. So I started writing down those. And then eventually that was published as an essay. I thought, if I didn't know this, I mean, for him it's self-evident. I didn't know these, I wrote them up and I'll share with the world. And this is the last picture of that essay uh, when Suntola got the European Semi Award 2004. Kindly, the Russians who have been working with molecular layering, AOD also since the 60s, they also wrote an essay of what they have been doing. So it's by Molina at all, it's for professors from St. Petersburg. And this is the last picture of that essay. I highly recommend you to read it. These both essays are full of details. This is also from 2004. That's uh, Professor uh, Alastovsky in the Winter Garden of St. Petersburg State University after a conference. So he's about 90 years old in this picture. 
and so it happy first is both. So what is the Russian speed? Well, there's plenty of information to find out and too much for one person to find out. This is one core reference so if you are interested you could have a look. It's from 1974. It's the same year when Tuntua came up with the concept of AI in Finland. Um, it's a review article. It's originally written in Russian. It's translated into English. It has been published already in 1975 in English. It's not only about molecular layering. They were academic people, very broadly thinking, but it's partly about molecular layering. And here is a scheme of molecular layering from that review. So you have a surface with some reactive sites, you bring a compound. It reacts, uh, releases gases molecules, then you can continue either doing, it, doing the same, building a material layer, or making this material. That looks pretty familiar, doesn't it? So I have had these feelings when I go through the material. So it's, you know, we, we had no idea of this, but it's so familiar. They have come up with the same, same ideas. So, when did they start actually? Well, we have had this virtual project on the history of ALV going on. We have more than 70 participants now, volunteers, working in an open science manner, reading through all the old papers. This is the first oldest one that we have found from 1965. This is the full conference abstract. The first time we see this work. Most likely they have already worked with this technique earlier, but this is the earliest um, thing that we can trace back. What did they run for? Well, well, I think this is not this is not your discussion though. When when can I have been looking into this? You know, you find something, and you find the next thing, and then the next thing. I cannot tell you everything that they have done. Um, so let's have a look at this one. This is from the same review, 1974, Visions of Alaskowski of where this molecular layering could be applied. So this is a copy pasted from our review article from 2017 in JBSDA. So he saw the possibility of surface selective deposition. He saw the possibility of inflating, um, regulating porosides and solvents. He noticed that molecular layering works in a similar manner on single crystals, on porous materials, and um, on fine powders. Turner materials were a rare seen, and catalytically active materials, and look at this, the last one. The proof to further miniaturization of microelectronic devices and to molecular electronics is evident. I am just impressed, also by the fact that it took so long to know about this. So what they have done, it has remained, to my understanding, mostly but not fully academic. There are some applications, nothing really big industrial scale, but something that you can call products. They have made different types of reactors with in-situ analytic, analytics. Uh, so here is an example of um, um, growth, a of the growth chamber with energy included, and this is already from the 70s. It's a new photo, but they have these publications very early with electrometric results. They work with sorbents. I heard a compound CO2 in a presentation here earlier today. I have seen that also in early papers. Um, they work with catalysts, coatings below a simpering temperature. Humidity indicators, there are also semiconductor related things, and they come from mostly from Drosh. Victor Drosh has been uh, building thinking AOD reactors, and uh, so he has also a paper on happening offset from the 70s. And then they worked a lot on powders, that was the emphasis on so that the broad application range. This is powder processing from 1987. And I think that now there are at least three companies who are commercializing powder processing by AOB, and there are quite some similarities between what is done now and between what they did then. I understand that these reactors have been scrapped, 
there was not enough demand or use, but these were also what I had at times by using. And just to give a um, feeling of how much it was, so Professor Molly Hint, the first author of, of the essay, he was invited to the Ireland AFP 2016 conference to give a plenary talk. And in his introduction, it is said he has authored more than 600 papers and more than 70 patent certificates. That just tells you roughly how much there is to find. I think these numbers are similar as for Eskela when he retired. So, two years ago, with 62 authors, we wrote a paper recommending reading list of early publications on average day deposition outcome of the virtual project on history of AFD. So there's so much here that nobody can grasp it all. So we have been working together and we actually voted to have a list of the most significant early publications. You can view the paper there. And this review ends up by saying up to now, a balanced overview regarding the early history of AFD has been missing. The current list is an attempt to remedy this deficiency. So there is, for example, this George review that was in the second slide, 2000 and sometimes, some uh, more times cited. It doesn't mention anything about the Russians. So this is something that is not very well known in the world. I think that another good review would be needed. And I am still considering to write that one in a big international collaboration, also together with the Russians and with anybody who wants to help. So if you'd like to, please contact me. There's we, we can divide the class in a meaningful way. Okay, then to this uh, totally different topic. Service chemistry of ALD, terminology, mechanisms, functionality, analysis. We will start very simple. What's the definition of ALD? Is there a definition of ALD? When I was writing, uh, I, when I did my doctoral studies, I found some modeling related to ALD, and then I wrote this big review article. And when you are doing modeling, you really need to define your system. How is ALD defined? In those times, I was also learning to know about this Russian sign, and I was reading a lot. And uh, because I couldn't find the definition, I found many wordy descriptions, but not a definition. I tried to create one myself, and it's here. ALD can be defined as a film deposition technique that is based on a sequence reviews of self terminating gas solid reactions. It says can be, because it was my definition and it was not used. But this is something that has been picked up by some other people later, so this is what we have now, and people could, of course, try to create better definitions. But this is one. <coughs> Let's look at the meaning. What is behind these words? So self-terminating gas solid reactions, some people call this in a different way, self-limiting. I ended up choosing self-terminating for the purpose that it really needs to stop. For the purpose also to exclude some processes from the definition. For example, there was a process by Roy Gordon where he was, by totally different chemistry, uh, growing maybe three nanometers per cycle or something. I wanted to exclude that. I thought that doesn't share the similarity with the processes that I know. So that's why I made this definition. So terminating in usual chemical terms, well, the process of the reaction needs to saturate, has to be saturated, and the amount absorbed needs to stay. So it means that we cannot have unsaturating reactions, which would be the CBD. We cannot have unsaturating. Uh, unsaturation, we need to give the process time to go to that level that the nature control, controls by itself. And we can't have <coughs> desorption, um, because then also we lose the control. So we have to have irreversible, saturating and irreversible reactions. We talk of gas solid reactions. That means we are talking of absorption. We are talking of chemical absorption, chemisorption, or reactive absorption, somebody might call it. Here I have taken from uh, Yuba Weiss, 
the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, a comparison of chemisorption and physisorption, short term. So, chemisorption has chemical specificity. It can be irreversible or irreversible. That's not irreversibility, is not a requirement for chemisorption, but it's for ALD and monolayer absorption. Here comes the monolayer again. ALD, simplified variant of CBD, I would say. So here is an um, image by Peterson and Elliot showing that what happens in CBD when you have continuous flow. Well, ALD excludes many of these uh, things by the separate pulse of the acting paper. So you just have the diffusion, absorption, surface reaction, desorption, and again, diffusion of, 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 or transport out of your species. Sequential use to produce a certain proper cycle, um, and that depends ideally on the reactants that you use, on the temperature that you use, and on the substrate or on the surface. And CBD would have a growth rate. ALD doesn't have a similar growth rate because it always stops by itself. So the proper cycle in ALD it's something that's it's defined by nature. Uh, and how long you do a cycle really depends. You know, if you are working with industrial things, some processes can uh, be saturated in over one second, and some others might be 10 seconds, and still it's the same growth per cycle. <laughs> Many types of reactant, co reactant pairs. I take this here because this is about uh, the nomenclature. Uh, people call these precursors. So uh, we, we have a lot of variation here. Uh, we see many examples of different chemical classes. At the, okay. uh, at the moment, I think there are more than 700 uh, reactant, co-reactant pairs in use. Um, typical chemisorption mechanisms or reactive absorption mechanisms. This is also from my review 2005. Uh, ligand exchange, dissociation, association. Very, very simple uh, ball illustration of what this means. Ligand exchange means that when you come with your uh, molecule from the gas phase, it reacts with a site on the surface uh, and a part, a fragment stays on the surface, and a molecule is released to the gas phase. So here, the ligand to metal ratio decreases from the original one. That would be the NL4 metal again. Dissociation, you react with the surface site and all fragments stay there. Association, you react with the surface site, you don't break up the molecule. These are the three uh, classes of react reactions that I came up with uh, for my review. Another view, a more recent view from highly respected people, John Barry, Francisco Zara, and Betty Alpo. We see the same terms, right? So these, these must be good terms. Ligand exchange, dissociation. Association, ligand exchange, exactly the same as I described for association. They have come up with three different types, depending on which part is binding. But here it's good to pay attention to dissociation. They actually mean a different thing with that. They use exactly the same name, but they mean a different thing. So here, you react with the surface and you leave a ligand leaves, maybe the gas phase, I don't know. Um, it gets released and the ligand to metal ratio decreases. I go back. In this definition, everything stays on the surface. In that definition, the part leaves. Even when people use these same terms, they might mean different things. So it's really important to define in words what you exactly mean when you talk about these in things. I would say that both versions of dissociation might very well be relevant. So I know examples where the one that has been in my mind has occurred, and I'm sure that there are examples of the other one. So we should together somehow keep track of these uh, definitions. Monolayer. So Suntola found that about one third of a monolayer gets grown per cycle. 
there are at least three definitions of a monolayer that can be relevant for A or B. They are also in that one review article from my from me, 2005 uh, depicted. So when Sokala talked about monolayer, he was talking about monolayer of the A or B raw material. Typically, the protocol is less than a monolayer. Typically, it is less than half a monolayer. There are some, some um, rare cases that you might get a monolayer. If you get more than a monolayer, you can be really suspicious. Chemisalt monolayer. In the chemisalt and Dupac slide, we also saw chemisalt, a monolayer, right? It's a different monolayer. So it means that when we have a chemisorption step, chemical absorption, it saturates at a monolayer. When no more material accumulates, it's at a monolayer. This is an example of a chemisalt monolayer. We start from the surface, we react so that nothing, no reaction takes place anymore. This doesn't look very dense and it doesn't have to be. It's not part of that definition. This is also a useful definition for AOD. Then there's still the physical monolayer. Well, then you think of a closed back surface of um, molecules or walls that can really move and, and get as close to each other as they do. Three really different definitions of a monolayer. So when you talk about monolayer or here of a monolayer, again, be careful. AOD window, this has a concept has uh, raised some discussion in the social media. Uh, lately, some like it, some don't like it. I just see it as the temperature range where a certain process can fulfill the ALP conditions. And now you hear some news. Uh, so there is a review called Compatibility in Atomic Data Deposition, Current Status Overview of Analysis and Modeling. It's in press in Applied Physics Reviews, and it's going to be out any day. The DOI link is already there. In a few days, it's already there. So this is quite clear, I think, to everybody. What is a conformal film? Well, it's a film that uh, coats all 3D objects with the same uh, thickness and properties. But how conformal is conformal? Because if you have more demanding uh, features, then maybe the coating doesn't go anymore there. So this is something that I have been working with in the recent years to develop test structures, and I have a demo chip with me, by the way, where um, the three structures are so demanding that no film goes across to the end, and then you can observe how the film terminates. They are made with MEMS-type mem uh, processing techniques, so silicon uh, um, when I started working with this conformality analysis, I wanted to compare results from different sources in the literature. And comparison was difficult, and I was actually told that you cannot compare because everybody uses different, different structures, and you know, it's like comparing apples and pears or apples and rubber boots, something like that. Well, for this review, we have actually worked out a way to compare to put all the results somehow on the same scale. And we use this uh, concept, whole equivalent aspect ratio, um, uh, abbreviated EAR, like the EOT, equivalent oxide thickness. That was our inspiration. And that scales any um, structure to how the system, how the coating would behave if it was a whole etched into something. Here are um, examples of three different types of 3D structures. There's a circular hole, there's a square hole, and there's a trench. They have the same aspect ratio, so the uh, length to width is the same, and the equivalent aspect ratio is the same for the two holes, but for this uh, uh, trench, it's not. So the coating goes deeper, more easily, and in the case of the trench, it's actually one half of that, of the um, of these holes. So that's one thing that uh, makes it easier to compare. And another one is a choice that if you have these infinitely uh, long uh, trenches where you analyze your thing, what do you compare? What, what do you look at? Like if you have a profile that goes down like this, do you look at, where do you define your comparison point? 
And we've come to suggest that it's a 50% penetration that, that we should take as the reference point. And this has come from many sources related to modeling, basically, that that could be the meaningful place to compare. So these are um, terminology things that are not yet established. I hope that they will be. And this is from the review proof. So just to show, with a different equivalent aspect ratio, uh, folded uh, relative depth. Um, well, not going into details, except that the records so far have all been attained with anomic alumina. But with these test structures, that I said are basically infinite, you can go to 10,000 to 1 aspect ratios. In principle, if somebody wants to uh, demonstrate much more, that the functionality here is possible. Saturation profile, that's a, a term that I like, also not established. And this is something that when we have these test structures, we are able to remove the top and expose the bottom and measure with whatever means you want to use for playing up silicon wafers, for example. You can measure the thickness profile, this would be the TNA water alumina. Uh, thickness versus profile versus scan length. And I think that this saturation profile would be a good term. It's uh, not quite not suggested by me, it's by Anton Yamaski. He saw that as the AOE observable, that is the characteristic feature of an AOE process. I think that this is a very useful concept. And I think that we would need to get this into the literature, but before that, maybe we would need to define this. What is the saturation profile, actually? So that we don't have, again, people showing quite different things with the same name. So here I would welcome feedback of how do we need to define the Y and the X scales. I have my own views on this, but I would like to hear from others as well. Okay, I actually don't have any idea of how I probably used my time very soon. Okay, some surface chemistry related questions. Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Okay, I was thinking myself, what, what should we know to characterize the surface chemistry of a process? I came up quickly with a list of 11 questions. You might end up with a few different ones. I think that these questions are not at all always asked in the literature. I would be interested, okay, which material is grown? That's obvious, but it's not always self-evident uh, for a, a reactant co reactant combination. Is it A or B? Is it saturated? Is it irreversible? What's the A or B window? It's growth proper cycle, which product byproducts, with the byproducts we have so which surface species are formed and how many of them? How much? Which are the mechanisms that take place on the surface? So these are still different questions. Seeing what is there is one thing, how it got there is another thing. What defines the growth per cycle? This is the question that has been in my mind for all these years, and it's not a question that people very often think of. Why do we have exactly one third of a monolayer? <coughs> how does the growth per cycle vary within the AOD window, and why are there impurities? How do they affect the growth? What are the kinetics of the growth? Often AOB processes are so quick that it's difficult to investigate the kinetics, but there have been approaches and, and there are hopefully better coming. Trimethyl aluminium water process has been already mentioned many times. Uh, I think that we can conclude that it has become a prototypical uh, AOB process. It's very, very widely used. It might not share all these features with all processes, but at least it's a useful concept to show how a well-behaving AOB process looks like. So what's the AOB window for this one? Well, here are my own results from my thesis a long time ago, where we were looking at uh, the, the trimethyl -alumin aluminum reaction with porous alumina, so fixed beds of 5 to 10 grams of aluminum oxide, high surface area. And measuring on the top part and the bottom part of the bed whether we get the same concentrations and from 80 to 300 degrees centigrade we got the same. And when we went then above, actually to 600 kelvins, then that no longer took place and actually I got some 
part of our material code. So that's clear when decomposition had happened. So I would say a room temperature up to something like 300. It will depend on your exact process, how quickly you see this decomposition, the onset of decomposition. But in these long exposure experiments on porous materials, you see them very sensitively. What's the growth per cycle? How does it vary with temperature? This is also from the review from 2005. I think this is also clear that at least for a part of this AOV window, we have a decreasing trend and the, we are somewhere centered around value of 0.1 nanometers per cycle. This is about 30% of the monolayer layer again. So different uh, groups have produced different results in different reactors measured by different means, and still the variation is not much, not more than this. So we can agree that we know how this nature works. We don't know yet what we do. We can just say that it is or see that it's like this. Yeah. So this has been uh, intriguing me, this question, and uh, on the uh, porous materials, we could actually control the number of OH groups by heat treatments and then do the reaction and then quantify the amounts of uh, carbon. And uh, in the case of silica, also aluminum atoms on the surface. And I have been looking at these trends. So that's the amount of aluminum atoms, that's the amount of metal groups. See that it's almost the same, even though we go from 159 OH groups per square nanometer. And we get the metal ratio. So if we look at this ratio, there is a continuous trend. It comes down. Um, it's not exactly linear. It comes down, and uh, if we compare it to two, which would be the limit that if we have ligand with exchange reaction, we would have two or less if there were more. We are actually on both sides of the two, and that doesn't seem to matter to this reaction at all. If we look at the amount of aluminum, Attached, we see a clear linear trend. That's a one. It's not a one to one correlation. Many people still seem to still assume that we have one OH group, it reacts with one TMA molecule, these two metal groups. Well, if it was like that, then we would have this trend. We would have a form where we don't. This is something else. And my explanation to this, just going through it very shortly, is that. This process, it consumes about all the OH groups on the surface. So the metal groups want to combine with the hydrogen and release methane. And the reaction goes on so long as there is space on the surface, so that we get to always about the same amount of metal groups. It's roughly about six per square nanometer. Um, that, is, that can be compared with the physical monolayer of metal groups, and that would be 7.2. So we are not very far off that. At least I can see that we have a highly hard surface there. This is not something that everybody would agree. If you discuss with some other ALD scientists, they might tell you a totally different thing. I think myself that this is one of the major things that I have done for the field of ALD. Kinetics. Kinetics. How fast are those reactions and how can we get information about those? Well, if we are able to measure these saturation profiles, then it's known from modeling that uh, how fast those reactions are, that will affect the, the leading edge slope um, of the saturation profile. This is an example by Adam Knobs and others, uh, where for splitting coefficient of 1, you get a certain slope, and for 0.05, you get less of a slope. So if we can measure these, and now we seem to be able to, we get to the uh, kinetic constants of the reactions. This is again from the review for this TMA water process. People have been reporting measuring by any possible means. Sticking coefficients that vary from 0.9 to 0.002 for the same process. Process That's quite a lot of variation. Now I think that we are getting to have the means. I will skip my very last thing, but this I will say. If we are using the saturation profiles to analyze the slope and then the sticking coefficient, that we need to do through modeling. And there we need to make assumptions of what are the surface reactions. 
And the assumption that's always made, basically always, is linear adsorption. Linear adsorption means association in the most simple case, and this is the one that is applied. It is just reaction association on one side, and it can be reversible or not. Flat surface, surface sites are equal, adsorbed species don't interact, and these are elementary processes. And in reality, AOD is not like that. So the sticking coefficients that we get from here, they are some lumped sticking coefficients, coefficients that may depend on how exactly the model was combined. It's still good to do it, but it's good to realize these limitations. Now I think I'm going to <coughs> skip. You can just see that Germany is on the map, and I will skip to the conclusion <laughs> that uh, AIB has been invented twice. The history is still not, still not well described in any major review. I think the basics of AOD are quite well understood, but there is work to do on this uh, nomenclature uh, side, and the views are evolving. This is a, an evolving, quickly evolving view. There's recent pro progress in the functionality measurement and analysis, and I think that there are great opportunities to uh, create better fundamental understanding. Nobody might want to pay for that but it can still be done and can be scientifically very valuable. The slide set will have some additional material that we get also then when we get the slides. data of the profiles, you see, uh, you see that at the end it goes back up. It's not a monotonous function, and not, not the experimental one. Further, further, the one from the uh, right one. Yes, this yes. one. Oh. So that, that at the end, that there are supposed, and I think I have a suspicion okay, that that is not a coincidence that you have in fact the purging is less efficient down in the structure, and as a commenter, I'd like to say that you have to take the in some you have CDD there, and so that the purging also has to be taken into account in the quantification of the, the copper mount. There, I can, yes, agree with you. I, I, well, I don't know if these come from uh, purging, uh, they are not very repeatable. We also have three layers here that will affect the measurement, but I do agree with you that purging is important. And I'm still looking forward, forward to see the CDD effect. I want to observe it, but I want to see where it comes and I still need to see it. But we need to make more experiments. We need to see it. Somebody will see it. Okay. That's uh, thanks. Good idea.